Cindy Kelly. I am in Riverside, California, and it is Tuesday, February 21st, 2017, and I have with me uh, Nancy Nelson, and I'd like her to say her name and spell it. Oh, my name is Nancy Nelson, N-A-N-C-Y, N-E-L-S-O-N. Tell me a little bit about yourself so we can put this in context. Okay, um, I was born in a suburb of Chicago, Western Springs, lived there all of my life, uh, and I'm an only child. And my dad had hay fever. He was allergic to ragweed in August, and in that part of the country, ragweed grew, and he'd sneeze and sneeze and sneeze. But we'd go up to northern Wisconsin, and ragweed did not grow up there. And we went fishing almost to the Michigan line. And we were up there on August 6th, 1945. And it was pretty remote. They had outhouses and anyway, we didn't hear about it until two days later. And then we did hear about it. Well, that didn't mean anything to me. I think I was 13. And so that was my first exposure with anything on the atomic bomb. And then, so I grew up as an only child and went to school in Western Springs and LaGrange. I went to high school. And then I went off to college uh, in 51 and came back and wanted a summer job. And the man across the street said he could get me a job, which I got. And I worked at Imperial Brass. They made brass fittings and uh, electric. Uh, refrigeration parts and I was just an expediter and so I would go downstairs on the squeaky, squeaky stairs to expedite find out when the orders were going to be shipped and off and on I would meet Dick if I was going down he was coming up or vice versa and that was my first exposure to him do you want to introduce him now and say his full name oh Richard Hadeen Nelson and he always said the H stand stood for honest. So his name was Richard Honest Nelson. <laughs> and um, we had a few conversations, but didn't really talk that much. And I had to end about the third weekend in August because in those days you could only make $600, and then your folks could not, if you made more than that, your folks could not uh, take you as a deduction. So he said... Um, call me when you come home for Christmas vacation. And I thought, I don't know whether I said it out loud or thought, why don't you call me? But Michigan State was on quarters, so we had to have finals, and I didn't know when finals were going to be. Anyway, I called him. When I got home, it was on a Tuesday. He was leaving for California on Saturday for three weeks, and he said, let's go out Friday night. Okay, I said, okay. And uh, we had, Chicago had a blizzard. They're good on blizzards. So my folks thought it would be rather stupid of him to come out in a blizzard. But he was an hour late, but he came out anyway. And then we went out and had a nice dinner, came back, and he left the next day for California. Uh, I went back up to school, didn't see or hear from him until the next summer when I went back to work at Imperial. And then we started dating on the QT, which was kind of hard to do in an old office building like that, <laughs> but <laughs> we did. And I, I would not come home Friday nights. I would wait there at work, and then he and I would go out on a date. And so that went on for the summer, and we had a good time and thoroughly enjoyed each other's company. And then I went back to school, and I would come down for weekends and he would come up to Michigan State for weekends. So then about Christmas uh, we decided that I better not work at Imperial the next summer. So I think when I came home at spring vacation I got a job at Hills Brothers Coffee as uh, an accountant on adding up coffee sales. So then, and that wasn't too far from Imperial, but it didn't work out because they, he got transferred to Boston uh, as a uh, territory. 
So they wanted me to come back to Imperial, and I said, no, I made this a commitment to go to Hills Brothers, and I'm going to Hills Brothers. And but before he left for Boston, he wanted to know when we were going to get married. <laughs> I said, I haven't finished college yet. And he said, I commuted from Chicago to Lansing. I am not commuting from Boston to Lansing. So um, my folks were married October 10th, and it had been their 25th anniversary. So we got married on the 10th of October on their 25th anniversary. It pacified them a bit, but I still think they wished I had finished school. Anyway, I didn't. And it was more important not commuting back and forth. So we got married, we went to Boston, had two apartments, and then we built our house. I thought we were going to be there forever, and he got tired of that white stuff every year. <laughs> so <laughs> he wanted to come back to California. So we sold the house, uh, quit the job. They wanted to come back to the home office, and he did not want anything to do with politics. He had heard about the politics. So we came to California, bought a house, it took over the existing mortgage, moved in in two weeks, and gave the kids, got the kids in school two weeks before Christmas vacation so they could meet. And we moved in the house before they, we had even closed escrow, which, anybody do that today? <laughs> no. So uh, we lived in Palos Verdes, and my folks came out for Christmas, and after they left, I said, don't you think it's time to go get a job? <laughs> He kind of agreed with me, so he had a job, he got a job, and he liked his work in California. And when Susan, the youngest, graduated from high school, he started talking about um, land. He wanted some land. So I thought four years, oh, he started talking about it when Susan was still in high school, but he really talked about it when she graduated and went off to college. So then he had a customer in San Bernardino, and he asked Ace if he knew of any land in Riverside. No, but my wife's in real estate in Riverside. A big mistake. So here I am. Moved here in 76, been here ever since. When Dick passed away, well, in early 2000, 2001, when he was going downhill, he said, I don't want you living here by yourself. And I said, oh, it'll take me five years to get the place ready to sell. That was 17 years ago. <laughs> and I'm still hanging in here. <laughs> and I like it. I really do. So let's see. Oh, then after we got married, in, when we came out here in 76, um, this place was a disaster. The house was a mess. The grove was even worse. And then, so we were working, we were both full-time workers at that point. Then we would get information about going to the 509th reunions. And I said, well, let's go to one. Nope, we won't have a good time. And he said that when they had one in Boston. And I said, we've got friends back there. We can go and, and see them. Won't have a good time. Uh, St. Louis won't have a good time. They had one in San Diego. You won't have a good time. And then Disneyland won't have a good time. And I said, well, we can come home if we're not having a good time because we're here. And then they said, oh, they were going to have one in Wendover, Utah. And I said, we're going. I didn't even ask him. But he said, you're not going to have a good time. We went. We had a marvelous time. There was no line between the officers and the enlisted men. And we went to every reunion after that. <laughs> so, and had real good times. Um, the people were nice, and it was fun seeing them just, you know, once a year from all over the country. Then, let's see, oh, then it was like 97 when Dick talked in heaven, and that's where he met Forrest and Forrest wanted to write the book, and I said, fine. So Forrest would come up here after school one day a week and with a tape recorder. And Dick liked to talk. He was a, a good talker. And they would sit on the couch here and talk for a couple of hours. Then I'd have dinner. 
and the four, three of us would sit there and eat, and then they'd come back here and do some more talking. This went on for, oh, a year off and on. And then, oh, Forrest wanted to go to a reunion, and they were having, having one in Wendover, another one in Wendover. So he said, I'll go and I'll drive, because Dick was health was going downhill. So we went. We, he had a great time. And, well, we did too. And that was the last reunion that he went to, and that was in 01. And Forrest didn't really finish the book, and it wasn't published until 05, 05. So Dick never got to see the finished result, but uh, I was happy with it. If you could tell us a little bit about your husband's uh, childhood, where he was born, mm -hmm. what his birthday was. Okay, Dick was born August 26, 1925, in Moscow, Idaho. <laughs> he had an older brother and a younger sister. And he, they, his folks moved to Los Angeles in 28, 29, and lived in southwest L.A. His brother went into the service in... Uh, 39 and was a pilot and Dick wanted to be a pilot too. He really liked planes and wanted to fly. So he graduated from high school winter 43 but was only 17 so couldn't enlist at that point. So he went to Idaho back up to Moscow and went to the university there for six months. Lived with his aunt who owned the hotel and had stakes at least twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> that was during rationing, too. So uh, he came back after that first semester and uh, went in the service, enlisted. He wanted the Air Force, so he enlisted in the Air Force and went in in August of 43. Uh, he went to boot camp in San Antonio and uh, Santa Ana. He was in uh, cadet school. And he loved to read. He read everything. Well, he strained his eyes. And in those days, you had to have perfect vision to get in the service. So he washed out. He was devastated because he wouldn't be able to fly. Anyway, they sent him to radio school. He thought, oh, my gosh, they overlooked it. I'm going to be in a plane now. I won't be pilot, but I'll be in a plane so he was at uh, Cedar Falls, South Dakota, radio school. Loved it up there. I think there were about 100 in his class, and he must have finished very, very high. And he loved it. He loved the did it the das And so when his class graduated, they all went to Clovis, New Mexico, which was the biggest B-29 base in the country at that point. Everybody was assigned to a crew in a plane, but Dick wasn't. And he thought, oh, they've caught up with my eyes again, and I won't be able to fly. And he sat there for about five weeks at Clovis with nothing to do except read and go to the movies. And he kept wondering what's going to happen. Finally, after five, five weeks or five and a half weeks, he got orders ASAP. He to go to Wendover, Utah. He took the orders to somebody there at the base. Never heard of the 509th Composite Group. There isn't such a thing. Anyway, it said ASAP, so they put him on a train. He went to Chicago first and then west to Wendover. Wendover did not have an airport, I mean a train station. You just stopped in the middle and got off, and everybody on the, on the train was ground crew. And he, his orders didn't have anything to do about ground crew. So he showed his orders to whoever was there at the station at, when they got off. Oh, you're set for overseas. You're the colonel's radio man. Oh, boy, did he feel good. So the guy said, uh, take this down to the radio shack. He took the orders down, and the, I guess it was a sergeant there, looked at him and looked at him and said, how many hours have you had in the air? Ten at radio school. The sergeant looked at him, and the crew, the original crew, was 
and on leave. The rest of the crew was on vacation, on leave. So Dick was put in every plane that was taking off, and for two weeks he got all his practice in. Then they came back, the crew came back, and Paul had already been to Omaha to pick out the planes, the 15 special planes that were built at, for Tinian. And the crew went and picked up the planes and came back. I think it was about the 25th of June that they went overseas to Tinian. And um, they flew some practice runs over Japan with actual bomb, but weighing the same weight. So they would fly over at 30,000 feet and then drop the TNT and then go back. They did four of those. <clears throat> before the, the big one. And um, there were still Japanese on Tinian, way at the other end, and they were just told not to go down there, just stay away. And there were other B-29 groups on Tinian, and they sang some kind of a song because they could not get close to the 509th part of the island. Uh, that was special. That was MPs and so on and so forth. So um, Dick really only flew the one mission with Paul and Dutch and Tom. They uh, bumped the original crew, pilot, co-pilot, and no, pilot, uh, navigator, and bombardier. And I think there were a few hard feelings about that, but uh, Tom and Dutch and Paul had flown together overseas in Europe. Paul had a very uh, big career over there. Anyway, he flew from England and he flew Eisenhower down to North Africa when they were getting ready for the invasion. And over there, Dutch Van Kirk and Tom Faraby flew with Paul. And they, you know, they had some stories on North Africa too. <laughs> And then that's when Paul got called back to the States, was after the North Africa part, to uh, test the B-29 that was having some flaws and having some hard times getting airborne. So he came back, and then Dutch Van Kirk and Tom came back. Tom Farabee came back with him. Tom, Dutch, and Paul only flew one mission with Dick or Dick only flew one mission with them, and that was the big one. And then, uh, oh, they came back after the mission. They, they dropped the bomb, dropped the nose, and made a 60 degree, 160 degree turn to the right with the nose down to get away from the bomb, and they were to be 11 miles away. And I think they were 11 or 13, one of the two. Anyway, they got away, and the tail gunner, Bob Karen, had a camera, and he took, a pic took the only picture of the bomb because the camera ship couldn't get the bomb bays open to get the camera to work. So they came back, they dropped the nose down and made their turn and came back to Wendover, uh, came back to Tinian, and landed, and there was a big party. There was more brass there. Oh, I'm going, I'll go back, because after they dropped the bomb, they had to send a message. Well, the radio operator had to send the message. They sent a message back, a coded message, that said, um, results good. And then they started talking about, well, we, Tom was upset because he missed the target by 200 feet. Well, on a bomb like that, 200 feet isn't anything. So, but they figured they better change it. So then they, he sent another message. Results, excellent. All right, now they had two messages, good and excellent. So who's going to believe what? <laughs> so they decided to send a third message. And they, the third message said, results, excellent. So there's two excellents and a good. And um, actually, on, on the run going over to to uh, Hiroshima, Dick was reading a paperback book because there wasn't much for him to do 
you know, as far as the radio goes, they had to keep silence. So he was very calm, cool, and collected, reading his paperback books. He read on trips like six and a half hours one way. That's a long time to uh, sit and do nothing. Anyway, what that, was his book? I knew at one point it was about a boxer named Willie Carter. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> anyway, they got back, and all oh, a lot of brass there from the Manhattan Project. And the crew members, the ground crew, and everybody, all those 15 plane crew, uh, crew members were having a beer party. Well, the, of course, the crew, the, you know, the gay couldn't. They had to go and be debriefed. And they all got a drink of liquor because it makes them relax. And there were more um, colonels and I guess captains, and I don't know, I think there were a few generals there too uh, at, the, at the debriefing. And after they were debriefed, then they got to go and have their liquor too. And then the Japanese did not capitulate then. So three days later, there was Nagasaki. And then after that, uh, they only had the two bombs, but they had a third one back in the States. And it was shipped from Wendover to San Francisco, and then they were going to put it on the boat and send it down. But they capitulated before that happened, which, which was good. So then Dutch and Tom and Paul and Bob Lewis, who was co-pilot, all came back to New York and had a ticker tape parade. Dick and the rest of the crew stayed uh, with the plane on Tinian from August to, oh golly, there was some animosity here in the States about dropping the bombs. So they didn't bring the plane back until no first part in middle of November. Then the original crew brought the plane back to Roswell, New Mexico. And that's where Dick was discharged. He was there for a week and got discharged and got the train and got home the day after Thanksgiving. Yeah. Hmm. So what, what was the animosity? You said there was a ticker tape parade. In New York. In New York. Mm -hmm. then, but Dick didn't come back right away because animosity. There was an, a lot of people in the States did not agree with dropping the bombs. So they decided to keep the plane over there. They didn't want anything to happen to the plane. So that's why it was there for three months. Then it went to uh, Chicago, to O'Hare Field, and sat there for quite a while until the Smithsonian got a hold of it. And the Smithsonian flew it back and I'm trying to get my dates straight on this. It went into storage. Uh, oh, golly, I'll think of it. They took, they took it apart, and they had boxes from floor to ceiling with named what part was this, what part was that. I'm, I, I know I've, I've been there because I saw it when they were putting it back together. Uh, I don't know if I remember it later, but anyway, it sat there for a long time, like from 1970s to early 90s, and then they put it back together, and for the 90 for the 50th anniversary uh, at the Smithsonian, which was on the mall at that point, and that building was not very big at all, so all they could use was the fuselage, and they had a uh, one of the tail markings on the wall and a propeller on the wall. And that was all that this, that Smithsonian would, would hold. And at that point, the people that went to that exhibit, more people went to that exhibit than any other exhibit at the Smithsonian. And this was in 95. And uh, because they figured there were going to be a lot of people showing up the Greenwich Workshop made a 16-minute film, and it had Tom Faraby, Paul Tibbetts, Dutch Van Kirk, Dick Nelson, and uh, Bob Karen, tail gunner. 
and they were all in it. And the people had to stand in line, but they could watch it while they waited to get in and see the exhibit. After they came out of the exhibit, they could sit down in chairs and see it again, which I thought was very good. You get put it more together. So, uh, uh, well, let me see. We went to Wendover numerous times before night, between 90 and 95 uh, to do filming. A lot of the filming was done at Wendover for this uh, 16-minute thing at uh, the Smithsonian. So after that, let me see, we started going to all the reunions and having a very good time because there was a distinction between the enlisted men and the officers. And then um, Dick would talk around here, and I always had to go with him and sit in the front row. If he didn't remember something, I could, I could generally fill him in on it, <laughs> which was fun. And then we would meet Dutch Van Kirk, because he lived in the San Francisco area. And we, would, we went to Castle um, Air Force, and oh, he came down here, and we went to March, and we've been to Yuma. We went to a lot of places together. And then we, the Iwo Jima survivors in Wichita Falls, Texas, wanted us to come. So we went there every year for five or six years. We met a lot of interesting people. We, we really did, and everybody was so nice. And the the bases that we were at, the kids were very tolerant and were very interested in what the Enola Gay crew had done. And then Dick started going downhill. He had COPD. He smoked like everybody else smoked back in the war, too. So um, he tried speaking as much as he could, but it was hard on him. He was on, on oxygen. So in 01 was the last reunion, and that was back up at Wendover. And uh, Forrest, who wrote the book, said he would drive us up there. So we went up, and he, he really had a good time. Signing, did more picture signing and book signing, and it was all done in the hangar that the Enola Gay was housed in at Wendover. And I guess the, that they're still remodeling it, but they've got it almost done. You probably know more about that than I do. So uh, he passed away, oh, uh, 2103, which at 3 a.m., which was three hours before the astronauts uh, were killed on reentry. And Forrest, who wrote the book, and he was talking at Dick's memorial, uh, said that the they wanted some very nice man to greet them at the pearly gates, and that was Dick Nelson. <laughs> so that's about it as far as, unless you have questions to ask me about something I haven't covered. When uh, Dick uh, was speaking, was he ever asked how he felt about uh, being part of dropping the bomb on Japan? Oh, yeah. He never hesitated at all. He said, I was doing my job. And if things were the same now as they were then, he would do it again. But he said, things are not the same. So, no, he, he really was all for it. Um, it, it, in those days, at that time, because if we invaded Japan, it would have been a disaster. Uh, they had kids in caves dug out uh, at, the, at the seashore, and their seashore was pretty rocky. Teenagers with spears to, to do the killing when the guys landed. No, more people would have been killed in an invasion that, than what the A-bomb did. And that, that's a real fact. So, no, he never uh, worried about it at all. He was doing his job, and it was something that had to be done. And it did end the war. It took the Japanese military a few days to realize it, but they finally realized it. The kids that were in the service really appreciated talking to him, and, and they were good speakers. Uh, and they were down to earth. 
they didn't play up any role of it. In fact, oh, lots of places, parents would bring their kids, and Dick and Dutch loved talking to the kids, and they would hold up the whole line just so they could, you know, kids, the kids could ask them questions, and they would sign pictures for the kids. So, no, it was, I had a very interesting life. I've met a lot of interesting people, and I'm still, I think maybe this one, this no, reunion in 17 is going to be the last one. But it's going to be in New Orleans, and I hope it's not the last one, but I got kind of a feeling it's going to be. Things can't go on forever. <laughs> you can hope they did. So, any other questions? So, let's see, what else? Did he ever um, express any fear? I mean, this was a uh, mission that was untried, bringing an atomic bomb, mm -hmm. and... And it was sort of, um... He was reading his paperback on the way over. <laughs> no, he never had any fear at all because he knew he was doing his job. And that's it. In fact, the whole crew felt that way. Um, of course, they really didn't know what it was, what it was going to be like. Uh, on the deep, on the, they always have a briefing before uh, they take off. And they were supposed to see film from El Maguado where they did the test, but the camera didn't work. So all they could see were some still shots. Well, when the bomb exploded and that mushroom went up as fast as, and high as it did, maybe if they had known that, they might have had a little apprehension. But that's why they would put the nose down and made the 160-degree turn. So they, they were told what to do, and there weren't any problems with the plane, with the flying or anything, not like with the boxcar. They had their problems, but they got back okay, too. So, no, uh, uh, he never had any apprehensive at all. No, he was calm, cool, and collected. Of course, he always said, I was too young to get worried. He was only 20 years and four months. Now, somebody that age nowadays doing something like that, I don't think so. They would have to at least be 21. <laughs> so, you said that um, they switched out the entire crew or some, something like that. Oh, uh, the pilot of the original crew, Bob Lewis, it was Bob Lewis's plane. He was pilot. and No, he was airplane commander. So uh, the original pilot, uh, I can't remember the names, was... Uh, eliminated and Paul took his place and Bob Lewis became co-pilot and the co-pilot was bumped and navigator and bombardier on the original crew were replaced by Tom Farabee and Dutch Van Kirk but everybody else was the same and they had they had an extra re, uh, radar man on plane and also, oh, the plane was not armed until they were in the air because they did not want the plane to go into the ocean and have a bad takeoff and blow up Tinian. So it was um, armed over Iwo Jima uh, before they pressurized. And let's see, Deke Parsons was a Navy commander, and he was on the plane. There were three extras, uh, Deke Parsons, uh, Jake Beezer, and Morris Jepson, and Morris was um, his assistant. But uh, no, it armed well in the plane. Nobody fell through the, you know, open up the Bombay doors, and there's not much down there except air. And but everything went fine. Dick was reading his book. Well, that all went on. I don't think I would be, but uh, he had only flown, you know, four other missions. This was just his fifth mission and over Japan, and everything else went fine. So he was not one to get worried. Did he fly any other missions after that? Uh, one. They took every B-29 in the area on Saipan and Tinian and flew about, I th let's see, the 6th, the 9th, must have been the 10th or the 11th. They flew all these B-29s over Japan and dropping bombs 
thinking, that why haven't the Japanese surrendered? Why haven't they quit? So, and then it was after that that they did quit. So whether that had anything to do with it or whether the hierarchy in Japan just finally decided it's not going to work. Never did find out that one. <laughs> so that, those flights would have been after the Nagasaki bomb, yes. but before yes. the surrender. Yeah. Like those mm -hmm. five days. Yeah. And there. Mm. So, and then they yes. called it quits. <clears throat> have you or your husband been to Japan? Dick went. I never did. Um, this was like in 88. Uh, the BBC wanted to do a filming over there. So, um, let's see who went. Dutch Tom or Paul, they didn't go, and I, I don't know why. Dick said he would go, and Jim Van Pelt, they wanted him to go, but he had had a heart attack, so he couldn't go. Um, oh, golly, let me see who... Oh, uh, Chuck Sweeney went. George Marquardt went. George was pilot of the third of the camera plane on the Hiroshima mission. And his son went too. So let me see, that was Dick, Chuck. Uh, oh, and I, I can't remember. He, Fred, Fred somebody. Anyway, there were five of them, and about 15 camera people from England all going over there. <laughs> they went to uh, the ho hospital, which was ground zero. The T Bridge was supposed to be ground zero, but they kind of missed it by 200 feet. Anyway, they hit the hospital, and they went to the hospital, and the doctor that was there was the son of the doctor that was on duty when they first were there. And uh, they, t they wanted to be quiet. They didn't want them to know who, who it was that was there filming. But somebody opened their big mouth and said, this is the crew of the Enola Gay. And the, the doctor jumped up and down. He was so glad to see them. <laughs> it was kind of a turnaround. So anyway, then, yes, they had a tour guide, a Japanese tour guide, who took them around, and they, well, the town, had, the city had been rebuilt. You'd never it had been uh, bombed like it was, but no, they had a real good time. Everybody was treated them nice that knew who they were, and that was in 89. Oh, yeah, and they... <laughs> they had to take um, malaria pills, which are like a horse pill. So Dick took, I think he had to take a couple before he left. He got sicker than a dog coming back over on the plane, coming back. They, they just didn't know what was wrong with him. Well, it was a reaction to the horse pills. So, no, he came back, recuperated, uh, enjoyed it. Um, never went back after that. But there really wasn't any reason to. We were too busy taking care of this place. So I think that takes care about uh, Hiroshima. I don't think um, Dutch and Tom and Bob Lewis, they went over after the droppings. Yeah, they were part of the, what do you call it, when the crew goes in to take over a country. They were part of that for a week or so. So they went back way back then. But I don't think they they went back uh, after that. Did you ever hear them talk about their reaction after seeing the results of the, the bomb firsthand? Oh, oh, um... Golly, I don't know if I ever heard that conversation. I'm sure they talked about it. I mean, it would be hard not to, being there in it. But uh, I don't know. They probably were glad that they didn't have to do any more bombing because that was pretty much devastated. And they say Nagasaki, they missed the target by, oh, 600 feet or something. And... 
the terrain was different too, because Hiroshima, it exploded 1,800 feet above ground, and the devastation went this way. They didn't want it going into a hole in the ground, and that hole kept going down, down, down. The devastation was because of the going sideways. So what, <clears throat> what advice do you have for the future generations with respect to the use of atomic weapons? Well, they use atomic energy now in a good way. If they can still continue doing it in a good way, that's good. But no more bombing. That's, that's no good. And the world knows it's no good because we don't want to end the world. And if too many people start using it, well, they're talking about doing it now. And uh -uh, I think people have to think twice. We have to learn how to live together peacefully, which doesn't sound too good the way things are now, does it? <laughs> this world is kind of in a mess, but uh, you just have to make the best of what you can do. So is there <clears throat> something, some things we haven't talked about that, that um, we should get you to say, you know, discuss? Either were there any other um, comments you want to make about the other members of the crew, what they were like? Well, Dick joined the crew so late, but uh, oh, after after 1990, and I insisted we go to that first reunion at Wendover. Then we went to all the reunions. And, oh, Dick and Dutch, they got along fine together. They would just tease each other and try to outdo one another. Uh, Paul was more reserved. Uh, Tom was a lot of fun. They all were a lot of fun. Uh, a couple of them died, like Staboric and Schumard. They died early, but nobody died of radiation. There was a rumor going around that uh, the crew was going to die of radiation. Well... There was no radiation at that because they weren't in it. It was only the ones on the ground. When we were in Boston, um, a doctor from Japan brought the Hiroshima maidens over for surgery, for cosmetic surgery. I don't know if you remember that. And he was a minister. I think he was a minister, maybe, and no. He brought them over. Anyway, he went to Boston and spoke, at, I think at a congregational church in, in Boston, and Dick was asked to go in and meet him, which he did do. I, di I didn't go. And uh, he enjoyed meeting him. He, he could speak English. And uh, they had a, a nice conversation together. I had forgotten about that. And then... Uh, the Iwo Jima reunions we would go to because they were so glad. Iwo Jima fight was horrible, and they were glad to see the you know the gay people, <laughs> so they wouldn't have to go on to uh, Japan. And one of Dick's close friends was in the Navy, and he was over in the Philippines, and he was getting ready to ship to Japan. And then he heard about the bomb, and boy, he was thankful he could come home. And then he got a letter from his mom saying that Dick was on the plane. He said, I didn't know he had anything to do with it. <laughs> so when he came back after the war, and he was wined and dined in L.A. Uh, a lot. He had to write a paper when he was going to S.C., and it was about his war experience, and the classroom was just in awe on the whole thing. And not a word was said. And then another girl had to go up and give hers. <laughs> he said, I felt so sorry for her because she couldn't do anything to upstage me. <laughs> I've spoken, I think, about six years. This will probably be the seventh. Martin Luther King High School here in Riverside has a Veterans Day. And all the veterans come, and then they 
break up the classes. It's, it's the seniors. And uh, so I have four or five kids that I talk to every every year, different, you know, mm -hmm. everybody. And it's it's grown. There's over two, and it's not just War Two because there are very few of, them, of us, but then all the other wars. And it's it's interesting, it, and the kids enjoy it. I think they've done it for 18 years, and it's it's still going. In fact, Corona has picked up doing on it now, too, so I've got that coming up in March. And then they want me, I don't know why, I've been out of this for so long, but um, I think maybe I'll be in a parade on Veterans Day, which is n November. So anyway, and I've got my 2,300 trees to take care of, so, <laughs> and 20 avocados. So I'm very happy where I am. <laughs>